Rina from LCA Spotlight, and this is our guest feature where we talk to accessibility experts and dig deeper into accessibility topics. Our guest today is Rachel Snyder from Artisan eLearning, and today she's going to talk to us about uh, accessibility for storyboards. So Rachel, could you please introduce yourself and tell us something brief about your topic before we launch into it? Sure. I'm Rachel Snyder, and I'm a lead instructional designer at Artisan eLearning. Uh, and this topic, I, I feel like people focus on accessibility a lot when it gets to development. Um, you know, the burden is on the developers to make things accessible, to come up with all the, the tricks, focus order, all of those things. Uh, but there are still things that we can be doing in the instructional design process, in the storyboarding process, to put accessibility at the forefront and also help the developers with that lift. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, would you, I think you have a deck prepared for us and would you like to go ahead and start sharing? Yeah, and I totally agree with you. You know, usually people don't uh, think about accessibility at the storyboard level. And, you know, we want to avoid that. We don't want it to be a bolt on where you come in later and say, hey, this needs to be accessible. Um, so accessibility for storyboards, the first thing before I get into any specifics of accessibility, my first big overarching tip is to make it a mindset, um, which this only comes with practice. So at Artisan, we've become so focused on accessibility that it's part of almost every conversation we have about a course. Uh, and the more you make accessibility part of your conversations, and part of your considerations at every step of the process, the more you'll just naturally begin to think about it. I mean, even, even when you don't really wanna think about it. So like, I'll watch a YouTube video, just cute cats or something. Uh, and the auto-generated captions are way off. And I, I immediately think, well, what if someone from the deaf and hard of hearing community is trying to watch this, like that these aren't helpful, or um, I'll notice a document or a logo, or I'll be on a website and I'll think, like, does this pass color contrast? Like, and that's not even, I mean, I don't have to think about color contrast and storyboarding, but it's a constant conversation. So it's constantly in my brain now. And so if it's in my brain that much during my, you know, personal time, it's gonna be on my brain when I'm on the clock and when I'm creating learning. So, um, it really needs to be sort of second nature uh, so that when you're making learning experiences, it's a constant thought and you start to do some of these things automatically. Yeah, I love that. And I, I hear you when you say about color contrast because I was recently attending like a presentation and you know it was outside of work. And the first thing that came to mind was, oh, this is, you know, the color contrast is off. And then, you know, I tend to not be able to focus because that's all I can think about is it doesn't meet accessibility standards. So yeah, I, I get that. Yeah. Um, so the, the four things that I really want to uh, talk about for accessibility is first creativity, uh, just how do you keep creativity in the accessibility process? Uh, then activities, so making those creative uh, ideas accessible. Uh, experience, so the other, the whole aspect, um, or the whole, the big picture of the learning experience, like narration, visuals, how, how does that play into it? Uh, and then also language, using inclusive language um, as you're making things accessible. Now, first for creativity, Sometimes when we think about accessible learning, the first thing we think about is the stuff we can't do. <laughs> we think of all the limitations and the challenges and the things to avoid. And I'm someone who doesn't like those limitations. I generally don't. I'm, I'm someone who approaches instructional design like the world is my oyster. So what's possible, what's interesting, what's compelling? So when I first started making accessible learning, I was really concerned that it would put my creativity like in lockdown. It's so limiting. I can't do drag and drops. How will people ever learn without drag and drops? Like, yeah. spoiler, they'll learn. It's nice. <laughs> so something I learned from um, Diane Elkins at Artisan helped me think of it from a different perspective. She says, it's more about what you add than what you take away. And she also shared an analogy with me so when we make learning experiences of any kind, we're building stairs. We're giving learners a way to go from here up to the next level, so to speak. 
when we make learning accessible, we're adding a ramp. So people who need another way to get to the next level have access. But when we add the ramp, we don't take away the stairs. The stairs are still there. So accessibility is adding a ramp, adding a way for more learners with varying needs to benefit from the experience, but we don't take away the stairs. Those are still valuable. So we want to build the stairs first. We want to start with creativity. Ask yourself, how can I teach the information in the most creative, compelling way possible to help learners reach the next level? And once you have that great idea, then think, how can I make this accessible? Swing for the fences, really start with an out there creative idea and then adjust for accessibility. I mean, if you start from a really boxed in kind of limited place, it's much more difficult to try to expand it and push yourself out of that and build in that creativity after the fact to make it more interesting. So start with creativity and then adjust for accessibility. So do you have like a framework you use to capture the process? Um, how do you like document this? Or is there like a tool? How do you do that? No, you know, it's partially it's just, again, it's it's making it a mindset. Um, and because Artisan creates custom courses and everything is basically, each one is basically from scratch uh, every time, I we generally allow, and I, I definitely allow the creative process to be different each time. So, um, so being, I, I, I start as if the course is not accessible, really. I start with how would I, how would I do anything? So actually I have an example I can share with you. Um, I created a course for the Inland Marine Underwriters Association, uh, IMUA, about ensuring fine art. It's one of my favorite courses I've ever done. And I even got to show it at the Learning Solutions uh, Conference Demo Fest in April. So I did the instructional design and the writing, and it was developed in Storyline by our development team. Uh, and I'm going to share several slides with you today so we can discuss accessibility. But let's let's talk about that creativity for a moment. Um, I'll just leave it on that guy right there. Uh, so from, from the beginning, I thought of the learners first because we always start with the learners, right? Who are they? What do they know about insurance? What do they know about fine art? Uh, and from my SME interviews, I knew that these learners were likely experienced underwriters, but many of them may be new to insuring fine art. It may just be part of their portfolio, not their main focus. So, um, and thinking of that, I mean, I'm a nerd who loves to go to museums, but not everyone is. And so the art world can be intimidating sometimes to people who aren't familiar with it. It can be a little outside their comfort zone. So my goal was to give them a little introduction to fine art along the way by using works of art throughout the course. Um, so many museums have open access collections online now with these high resolution images of amazing art uh, and they're free to use. So why would I use a bunch of stock photos when I could use the real deal. Right. So that was my creative starting place for this course. I mean, how can I incorporate art meaningfully into the activities uh, that I'm asking learners to do? And let's be honest, I love a theme. I love a theme. It helps me write courses that feel cohesive, you know, and, and interesting from the activities to the visuals, everything is, is tied together. Uh, and to be fair, for every cool, you know, fine art course that I do, I have five, what I would consider like standard kind of courses, ones that maybe aren't suited for a big thematic treatment. Um, but I still think about what can make them interesting for the learners, always starting with the learners, uh, maybe learning through scenarios uh, rather than a bunch of just presentation screens and simple knowledge checks or gamification or some sort of reward for completing sections, just like you would for any other learners for any other kind of course. Uh, like example, I did, I recently did a medical course uh, and I started out with a hiking analogy. We often start out with like a little hook activity to get the learners interested. Um, and then I realized that it worked to actually weave that analogy throughout the course. It made sense. So instead of every slide being full of clinical medical center images in white hospitals, you know, those glowing Getty white hospitals, <laughs> Um, I was able to have like sweeping vistas of mountains or paths through a forest. And 
activities that helped them connect the dots using this analogy. So the client was on board, which is always a factor. I will not say that's not a factor, but it resulted in a course that was engaging and helpful and it was fully accessible, but also beautiful. So and it, it got learners out of their clinical setting for you know 20 minutes at a time, uh, which makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. So when you design these activities, and you said you think of ways, the creative activities first. So when you make them accessible, do you provide an alternate or do you just look at the same activity and say, hey, how can I just keep this one activity, but then make sure all the learners are able to use the same one? Right, exactly. So it's it's about um, creating a... It's making the creative activities accessible. So notice I didn't say create accessible activities. Again, we wanna start with the create creativity and then adjust for the accessibility, not the other way around. So when, I'm, when I come up with an activity, then just like you would with any sort of course, whatever you're coming up with, you wanna consider the objective of the activity. <clears throat> what do I want the learner to do? What are the mechanics? So this is really where a lot of accessibility comes in is the mechanics. How does it work? Um, and then the senses. So what, what senses does a learner need to be able to complete that activity? Um, so I've got, I've got an example of, of how, of, I'll, I'll take you through how to, how to do this. So um, for the activities objective, if we're talking about the objectives first, Ask yourself, am I teaching something new? Is it a knowledge check for something they just learned? How will their critical thinking be activated or reflected? Those good you know, instructional design questions that we start with. Uh, so consider for a moment this, the objectives in this fine art course, including the art was partially to help them feel more comfortable with that world uh, and, and introduce them to some fine art, but also a valuable point is to give them a sense of urgency about their job, why they need this information. That's always something that we're trying to get learners to understand. I mean, it's, is it another click through like, okay, I got to do this training because they tell me to, or can we help them feel like, gosh, this is really important. You know, I, I see the value in this. Um, I mean, we all know that art just gets to sit safely in a museum all the time, right? Well, except when it's traveling thousands of miles around the world to get to other museums or when it's being bought and sold or when it's in storage. So <laughs> to help them understand why insurance is so important, I wanted to give them a glimpse into the world of damaged, lost, stolen art, why these objects need to be carefully insured. It gave a chance for some interesting engagement, but also gave them that sense of urgency, like, oh, it doesn't just sit still. It doesn't just... Um, you know, hang out in museums all the time. <clears throat> so one of the activities to give that sense of urg urgency was about assets and losses. Now, fair warning, if you've read this just now, if you can see it, uh, it says select and drag the artwork to the appropriate destination. <sighs> it's a drag and drop. No, that's what I thought really when I saw that. I, I was know. like, oh, wait. <laughs> I know. So this course is not a completely accessible course. Um, artisan, like now our, our default is to create accessible courses. That's our default setting is, is completely accessible courses. But at the time I made this, this client did not opt for a fully accessible course. It's got some baseline accessibility, uh, like um, color contrast, uh, captioning, those sorts of things. Uh, but I'm showing it to you because it's a highly creative, beautiful, interactive course that with just a few tweaks can be made fully accessible without losing any of that. And so now we have the chance to come up with these ideas. So when you start thinking about the mechanics of an activity, um, go to the next one. Um, when you start thinking about the mechanics of an activity, you start thinking, um, is it matching? Is it a simple response that could be done with like a multiple choice question? Uh, is it a longer response that maybe use text entry for? What, what feedback should the learner get for any of these? You think through all the elements. And you could even ask yourself, what I like to ask is, how would I teach this if I, if I was in a classroom of learners? 
uh, and that can give you a good starting point. Would you would you just ask a question? Would you want them to turn to their partner and share like a more of a reflection or, or open ended thing? Um, I, I'm a firm believer that anything you can do in a classroom, you can replicate in an e-learning course. You just have to come up with the right mechanics for doing it. So now let's think about the mechanics for this particular activity for a moment. The learners are supposed to decide which painting was acquired for the most the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York for the most they ever paid to acquire a, an object, or which painting was stolen from a museum in Cairo twice and has never been recovered. Then they drag each painting to either acquired or stolen, uh, and then they get their answer. So if I were doing this in a classroom, I might throw these two works of art up on a side and ask for a vote. Who thinks, you know, the Van Gogh was stolen. Who thinks it was the painting of Mary? Um, so if you're looking at this activity, what are some other options we have besides making this a drag and drop? So this is likely where I might bring my developer into the conversation. So Sabrina, why don't you be my developer today? And we can we can come up with some ideas for how we could make this very simple activity, something other than a drag and drop and keep the interesting art, the interesting engagement portion of it. Do you have any ideas just off the top of your head? Um, I know I just sprung this. If it could be like a multiple choice. Where, it, it could um, just be, a, it could be multiple choice. Yeah. So where the learner could just tab to it if they were using a keyboard. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's all I could think of right now. Uh, no, I could also, I could even just have the two paintings and um, you can make accessible drop downs. So I could have a drop down and have them choose for each one, whether it was acquired or stolen. Um, I could just have like, you know, buttons under each one, acquired or stolen, acquired or stolen. They only get to choose one. Right. for each of them. Um, it could be radio buttons even. So it can be the same activity, but instead of the drag and drop, which is not accessible, we have, I mean, that was like four other options we've got to make it accessible. So right. that that's an easy way to do this. Just, I mean, if you have both skill sets, like of being an ID, you know, an ID and develop, you know, the development set like you can probably think through yourself but if you need help from a developer like ask your developer um there's an easy there's usually an easy solution that they can come up with that doesn't even i mean and that doesn't even require like coding and all that banana stuff that some some developers do it's just a very simple fix oh. um and it makes it a little more interesting than just being a text only activity or something like that. And in case, in case you're just curious, the Met acquired this painting of Mary uh, for $45 million, the most they ever paid for a single object. And it's the size of like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And then this painting by Van Gogh was stolen twice from the same museum in Cairo and has not been recovered. And it's worth like 45 to like $55 million. So this does give that sense of urgency. Like that's how much money we're talking about for some of these paintings. So our learners feel that like, what if that's in my portfolio? How do I make sure that all my wording is right for that? I know. And I love the way, you, you know, it's such a creative way to, you know, kind of uh, like the hook. It's so creative because then it's, it's a real life example and it actually gets you thinking. So I love that. Yeah, and it did take me a second. So I, I I researched those. I typically do not like to do research outside of what my SMEs give me as far as the content goes. So for this, because of that sense of urgency, I did additional research and I took the activities to the SMEs and I said, I'd really like to include these. So it, it's engaging, but it also gives them an understanding of why this job is important. And the SMEs said, this wasn't in our content. And I, so I, I made sure I gave them the sources, the news stories that these came, you know, these kinds of stories came from. Um, but it just it adds to the level of engagement um, and making it accessible can just take it to that next level. Um, and then finally, you wanna consider the senses required to complete the activity. And I know that's, that can be a 
challenging thing to think about, um, but we want to avoid activities that require one particular sense to complete. For example, listen to this clip from a customer call and give feedback. What if my learner has a hearing impairment? So if my learner has a hearing impairment, what ramp am I building? It doesn't mean I have to get rid of the activity. What am I adding for additional folks? Like, is there, is there an option for a transcript? Can I put a transcript in there? Will that uh, give them the same experience? They'll still be able to complete the activity even if they uh, have a hearing issue. Um, something like, watch this video. What is the healthcare professional's body language commuting, communicating to the patient? You know, they're looking for arms crossed and back turned and things like right. that. Like, what if my learner is visually impaired? What ramp can I build? So can I make a descriptive audio version or can I make a transcript that includes the descriptions, relevant descriptions of what's happening on screen? So again, I'm building that ramp. I'm not getting rid of the activity. I'm not changing the activity. I'm just adding more tools. Uh, and then I've got one more. If the answer is yes, select the green button. If the answer is no, select the red button. I've got learners who are colorblind. Right. You know, the green and the red look about the same. And so my ramp here could just be changing it to select the yes button or the no button and add text to the buttons. Can the button still be red and green? Absolutely. No need to take away the stairs. Go with your initial idea. They can still be red and green buttons. But is the activity significantly altered if I add yes and no to those buttons to help someone who is colorblind be able to distinguish? Not really. I mean, it's really the same activity. They're getting right. the same interaction. It's just got one more thing to help people. And, you know, you could think, well, a screen reader, if someone's using a screen reader, the button could have alt text that tells them it's a red button or a green button. But as a colorblind person using a screen reader, they, unless they're otherwise visually impaired, probably not. Um, so if, if the color is the only distinction between the buttons, how are they gonna know which one to choose? A screen reader will not help them in this case. And it's, I don't know, sometimes it's a challenge to think about all the different kinds of learners that you have that could have any number of disabilities or impairments that would make learning difficult. Like I totally get that. But at the same time, if I can make a course better for, I don't know, 20% more learners, 30% more learners. I mean, some people, the numbers for disabilities in the workplace range like very wildly because the data is difficult to acquire. But I mean, up to 30% of the workforce could be disabled in some way. So if, if I'm enabling a third more people to learn and do their job better just by these little tiny things, like that's super worth it to me. Um, and putting it in the storyboard takes the onus off the developers to think of everything. Right. You know, there are some things that they just, everybody, things slip through, it's, it happens. So the more, and there's gonna be things that I, I'm gonna skip in a storyboard sometimes that development will come back to me and go, oh, you know, we need to change this wording or that we need to change kind of how this works. Sometimes that happens, but if we're all working on it, if both sides are helping, to get to that goal, like how much more accessible can we make learning overall? Like, that's super cool to me. Yeah, this is perfect, yeah. Well, and, and speaking of that, I mean, you know, there's more to a course than just the mechanics, um, just the activities. We wanna think about the experience for all learners. So how can we make a course that's engaging and interesting, creative, challenging, a course that's going to help people grow and learn. Um, <clears throat> and we often, for that, we think about, when we think about the full experience, we think about narration and visuals, including any on-screen text. Um, you know, when I, I first started at Artisan a few years ago, our accessible courses had static screens. Nothing could fly in and out, synced with narration. Sometimes there wasn't even narration. Uh, we still have courses that don't all have narration, but um, sometimes all the, so the ones without narration, all the text, we all the things we wanted to tell them all had to just be on the screen when the screen started. Right. And it was just going to stay that way. Um, and it was 
it was a decision that we made, um, and it was mainly to help learners tab through slide easily uh, if they were using a keyboard and each screen could easily be read by a screen reader. Uh, they it could often be boring. Right. And it was for them to also at the same time be boring and also visually overwhelming with everything just like sitting there the whole time. Right. Yeah. Um, so I've got um, I've got some examples that I can show. Uh, the workaround that we've discovered is to write slides as if you're writing a video. And some people already think about their slides like that, I'm sure, when they're writing. Um, so when I, when I write a storyboard, I typically write the narration first, the things I want to say about that topic. And then I read through the narration and I imagine what I want to happen on screen at the same time, just like playing a movie in my head. Uh, and then I choose the activities and visuals accordingly. And then I go back and I adjust the narration if I need to. And so it's kind of a back and forth process. Um, and in most videos, you've got things happening, happening visually and audibly at the same time. And as an instructional designer, we're always making decisions about what the learner needs. What do they need to do so they can get better at their job? And for a video, it's what visual and audio cues will help them understand this concept or uh, will help reinforce this concept. And remember, we're building ramps. We're not taking away the stairs. You can have visuals and narration, and you can have things coming and going from the screen if you consider how you're making that information accessible to more learners. Um, so first, let's talk about narration. I love narration. I'm an actor in my free time. Uh, and so I love the idea of, of having the, um, you know, narrator reading my life or something. Um, so whatever is in narration can be captured in a lot in the storyline or captured in a lot of ways. So if we offload essential information into narration, it can be displayed in captions as the video plays. Um, it can be captured as a transcript that the learner has access to. Um, so with th just those two things, narration is easy to make accessible. So offload any essential narration in essential information into narration. And when you do that, that even frees you to do something more visually interesting on screen. So for this slide, for example, the narration is describing what is art slide. And the narration is describing various types of art, paintings, murals, sculptures, pottery. So, I mean, it's all, oh, and it also goes into like armor and memorabilia, and there's a lot of categories here. Now, could I just list those as text on the screen? Sure, I could. It's more interesting. The more interesting choice is to show them all these things. Um, and if the learner already has it in captions and in the transcript, do I also need to put on the screen that it's armor or that it's memorabilia? or that it's, what's the next one? Oh, artifacts, like archeological things, vehicles. Do I also need to put it on the screen? No, not really. You've already said it. They've had it in text in multiple ways. So the tricky part is when we get to the end here, I've got, I, I did have a list at the very end. It's just brief. It's not the point of the slide. But then I stick in this little bit. All of these are insurable under a fine art policy. Now think for a moment if I only had that on the screen and I didn't have it in narration. Like a learner with a visual impairment may not even know it's there. Um, and it's pretty important information that I'm just throwing on at the end and running the risk of the learner not getting it before going to the next screen if it's only on the screen especially if your focus order is off or something, a screen reader could skip that. Right. Uh, so if important things are coming and going from the screen and that's the only place that the information occurs, then the learner could miss out. Um, so putting it in narration, make sure that the learner gets that information regardless of whether or not they can see it happening on the screen. So do you try to keep most of your content in the narration? Because, I mean, you know, like like you said, we don't want to overwhelm the learner with all the text on the screen. And then you just have your key points appear on the slide, which is yeah, a focus order, too, so the learner can type. Right. Yeah. 
Right. And so then at the end, like if they're using a screen reader, they still could use the screen reader to go through this if they wanted to have it read again. Um, but they also don't have to. So the only the exceptions are like, so if I'm doing a click to reveal or something like that, um, I'm not narrating all of that. So because there's a point where I give them the directions, that's the last thing narration says. And now it's just purely on screen stuff that their screen reader can get through. Um, so again, like we, we need to make sure that everything is text only. Um, I'm, I've been doing a tech course with code. And so I could use screenshots of the code, but then a screen reader couldn't read it. And I'm sure that there are coders who need additional um, accommodations. And so I want a text reader to be able or a screen reader to be able to read that text. So being intentional about what a screen reader can capture um, and when it needs to capture it. So if I was putting, you know, earlier in the video when this stuff is flying in and out, a screen reader can't capture those words at the same time. If it could, I really want it competing in narration. So if I know that at the end of all this activity, it's going to turn into a click to reveal, like then that text can handle itself. But anything happening during narration, I'm going to assume the narration needs to handle it and have it not be on screen. So the other thing that this helps with is if you're offloading everything into narration, the other thing it helps with is alt text. Um, it pairs down the amount of alt text you need. So if I said, you know, painting, sculpture, pottery, and had pictures of those things, do I need to add alt text that says painting, sculpture, pottery? It's already done. Um, so my, my, my practice is to use alt text with discretion um, just because it's really, alt text is really only needed when the image is essential to the content and it hasn't been referred to or explained sufficiently in narration. So if, is it essential to the learner to know that this pottery is blue and white? Eh, depends on the course. I mean, is it a course specifically about blue and white pottery like Delft or Wedgwood? Then sure, describe away. But for this fine art course, using generalities. So there's no need to provide alt text for each of these images and add to a learner's cognitive load with unnecessary information because they've got as much as they needed in the narration. So it also helps cut down on the alt text that you need to use. Um, and finally, in thinking about the learner's experience, um, think about representation in visuals. Um, are you including people with disabilities? And, and I know people, you can have someone in a wheelchair with a physical disability that you can see. Um, it's sometimes more of a challenge to, to get someone who is visually impaired. How do you, how do you find something like that? Um, or deaf and, the deaf and hard of hearing community. And so sometimes you have to be creative about that. Um, but I've even found um, like a simple stock footage video of, character a woman using sign language and it's got you know it says what she's saying in sign language um and i'm like oh she's saying she's got one that says hello and she's got a, there's another video of her saying can you help me uh so that that's hey i can build a scenario off of that she's a character in my <laughs> and so so think about interesting ways to include those people because like i said i mean it's estimated up to 30% of the workforce could have disabilities. So that representation is important when you're thinking about representation as a whole um, in, in the images that you choose, the videos that you choose um, and those sorts of things. And that also plays into language, using inclusive language. Um, consider the possibility that the learners may not have the ability to do some of the things that we frequently ask learners to do. Look, see, speak. I mean, how, would, how does it feel? If you saw that, you could not do that thing. Um, so think more specifically about what asking the learner to do. So, um, Let's, let's you and I think about these for a second, um, Sabrina. So take a look at what's a what's an alt. We say that a lot. Take a look at this graph. Take a look at, at this um, this data something. Um, when we're asking people to make comparisons, take a take a look at these two values. Um, so what's something that we could very easily replace it with? 
maybe review this data? Yeah, review, review it, uh, review the data. It's easy, an easy change. Uh, take a closer look at, I mean, there's, you, you take a look, there's a look that you take, but then there's also a closer look. So that could be maybe like examine. So yeah. examine these two things. It also helps you not to be so repetitive. So if I say review, review, review a lot, um, like examine gives me another option, um, observe. So those are things that can be done whether or not you have eyesight. Um, so something uh, like talk to your supervisor. Um, not everyone has the ability to talk, speak. Um, so you could say something like discuss or have a conversation with your supervisor. Um, I actually, my sister-in-law works with the deaf and hard of hearing community, the DHH community. And um, she, I asked her once, I said, in sign language, when you're conversing, speaking with people, do they use talk, the word talk? When they're like, can I, can I talk to you later? Or something like that. Do they use the word talk? And she said, not really. They, they use, it depends on the context, but they usually use, use something more like discuss or a conversation. Uh, sometimes they'll even use sign, sign later, um, but they don't really use the word talk, which makes sense. Why would they? <laughs> so just knowing that helps me think differently about the language that I use because I could have assumed, ah, it's just a, it's an idiom. Everyone uses that. Everyone says, you know, talk to your supervisor. Everyone knows what it means, um, but it's, it's not necessarily so. If you see, if you see something, say something. That happens a lot in uh, harassment trainings, things like that. But what about if it's, if you notice something, uh, if you notice something, something, tell someone. Now, tell can take on a lot of forms. You could email someone and that's telling. You don't have to use your your voice. Right. Um, you don't have to speak it. So that one, there is always some room for interpretation of these. Um, so sometimes there are idioms. And you really, what I really think about when it comes to idioms is, is it is it describing the physicality of an action? Or is it just a common turn of phrase that conveys a specific meaning that really doesn't have anything to do with the physical aspect? So I'm gonna walk you through these steps. People, people know the meaning of that. Does it really have to do with physically walking at any point? No. So am I gonna walk, am I, am I gonna say walk? Or am I gonna go around the block and try to come up with a different way to say it? I could say, take you through these steps easily, right. but am I going to get super hung up on that one? No, because it's not really talking about the physical, physical thing. The other ones, I'm asking a learner to look and right. to talk and to see, like, these are things that I'm asking them to do, but walk through these steps. I'm not actually asking them to, to do the physical aspect of walking. Um, a challenging one that I've come across is the, the concepts of feeling heard and having a voice. Those come up a lot, especially in DEI or um, like some sort of empathy based training. Uh, and they have very specific connotations that both have to do with being understood by someone else. But if I said, I feel understood, it feels a little different than feeling heard and having a voice, you know, I could, I could say you know, like I being understood or having agency, but being even, empowered, maybe being what being empowered or feeling empowered, feeling empowered. There are some yeah. other options. So, but are they going to like, they don't always have that same right. recognition. And because we're not really asking, we're not really talking about the physicality of hearing or of speaking, having a voice, these are two where I'm not, I'm not going to take the long way around necessarily to explain them in a different way because they have such a specific meaning. So as much as I'm able to, I consider what I'm asking the learner to do and if it requires this physical aspect. Right. And then... If it's an idiom where it's 
you know, it, it does a, it has a specific connotation and it's a specific thing that you recognize, I'm probably not going to change it as quickly um, because it's, most people will understand that in a different way. So um, when we're talking about language, it's important to make sure that people feel um, included, that people feel like they're able to do what you're asking of them. So um, the more that you can focus your language on, you know, the skills rather than the senses, the better. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to have that distinction, you know, just to think about is this like a really a physical action you need to, like you want the learner to do? I mean, is, is the language communicating that? So do you have, do you refer to a resource? I mean, you know, like you said, like we don't want to say review maybe all the time and, you know, that kind of is um, repetitive. So do you have like a resource for inclusive language or for somebody who's just new or starting out? Is there something I don't that have a, yeah, I don't have a specific resource for that. Um, but I, but internally, what you can do is you can bake it into your process. So we have a, a uh, like during the store, the copy editing process, our copy editors are asked to specifically find the sense, any sense based language. So I try to keep it in mind when I'm writing, but sometimes again, some of these are so common for us to, to use, like, take a look at, you know, let's, let's look at this together. <clears throat> it's so common. They're just turns of phrase that we use a lot in e-learning that sometimes I do it without thinking. And so I don't catch it even on my, you know, reviews. So we ask, we have specific words that we ask our copy editors to find. So they, you can even just do a seek and find, like a, like a find and we find and replace. Right. Yeah. Uh, feature. So look, see, say, pop. Those are some of the most common ones. Um, you don't usually get a lot of feel ones, like touch related ones. Um, listen. So listen to your supervisor. Like you could say pay attention instead. So um, so we try to think of the senses and 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 I have like a an, a list that I made for myself um, that's look, see, say listen, um, talk, speak. And I, I go and try to find those. Uh, but then we have that extra layer built into the copy editing level. Um, and then in our, during that point as well, when it goes to copy editing, it also goes to an internal uh, storyboard review, specifically looking for any uh, see, I even just said looking just now, uh, specifically trying to find um, any accessibility issues. So we have someone who looks specifically for any activities that are not going to be um, accessible. So if I let a drag and drop get through, you know, they're going to say, this one's not right. Um, there are also things that I didn't know about until more recently, like um, the amount of text that you can fit into an on-screen box without a scroll bar. Like that's um, 1,024 characters. Oh, that's wow. the max that will fit in a text yeah. object. So I've got a post note right here that tells me 1,024 right. characters is my max for a text object. So when I've got, you know, a click to reveal or something, and it's, I got a lot to say, I had a lot to say on that topic. I've got to think, mm -hmm. is this going over a thousand characters? Is this worth, <laughs> do I need to break it into two parts? Um, so again, that's something that happens in the writing process that when, then when it gets to development, my developers don't have to throw their hands in the air and go, that Rachel, she tries to say too much in too small of a text space. <laughs> so, um, you know, just, just things like that, um, yeah, that I, I've, I've had to learn along the way. Right. And especially if you're working where you don't have that second layer, you know, somebody going to edit your work or a QA person. I think it's it's a good way to just document all this and just make it a part of your own QA check. Yeah, that is yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Um, and even if you don't have someone, I mean, if, you, if you're a contractor and you work on your own and maybe you don't even have someone, um, like maybe your client doesn't even have someone to to copy edit it's it's always worth i think paying a professional copy editor to look over your stuff like i used to 
I used to be a professional editor in my spirit. Like that was what I did for a long time. And the, the things that someone else can find that, I mean, I've been a professional editor and I can't find everything in my own work. It's so different when you write it yourself, that second set of eyes just to catch glaring errors really makes a difference. Um, and especially with this, when it means the difference between someone feeling included in your learning or in their learning or not, or someone being able to complete an activity or not. Um, so a, a copy editor can, can find words, punctuation, things like that. But you really have to be vigilant on your own about the kinds of activities you choose and things like that that a copy editor is not necessarily looking for unless, you know, they're trained in that specifically. So there are some things they can find, but some of it you just, again, have to make it a mindset so that you are intentionally thinking about accessibility every step of the way. Again, starting with creativity, like always, always start big and you can always bring it in if you need to, but it's really hard to push out later and find that creativity and, and puff it back up again. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's all yeah. I've got. So well, thank you so much for sharing your process uh, with us, you know, and it's it's very rare that, you know, we uh, think about accessibility at the storyboard level. And, um, you know, I'm, I was really excited to have you on to talk up to us about this. So a um, couple of questions um, I had was, so when you communicate your, uh, your storyboard to your developers, so I, I assume you have a framework and then you probably have something in there where for each uh, each activity or in your script, you have a process to document that too? Um, yes. So, so um, in our storyboard, um, I share visuals. I share um, any directions that I've got. So I don't, sometimes I will call out in the storyboard if I think something is going to need alt text. So if there's a graph or chart, that I say like, this needs alt text, here's my alt text. I'll, I'll include that in the storyboard. But for general images and things like that, I don't include alt text unless I know it's gonna be important to the instructional design. Um, but in the, like, again, our developers are trained to do the WCAG um, accessibility. So <clears throat> while it's still a process and I mean, accessibility and those WCAG standards are a little, can be a little, feel a little gray when it comes to how it applies to things like e-learning or apps. Um, it's, it's a little, it's, it's a changing landscape. So we're doing our best to stay on top of um, anything that we can do to make our courses more accessible. Um, <clears throat> again, something that our, our company always says is, is, you know, why should we determine who gets to get better at their job like shouldn't everyone have the chance to get better at their job so the more we can incorporate accessibility into every course into every step of our process the more people will benefit from the courses so for my developers i describe as much as possible but they're also trained in it too so um we can we provide sort of checks and balances for each other in that way Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that works great, right? Where you both of you are kind of keeping a check on that. So, um, are there any resources you would like to share with the with our community, um, just you know, regarding making storyboards accessible? I know there's the WCAG, and like you said, it it can be confusing. Um, is there anything else you would think might be helpful? I mean, there are there are lots of resources, lots of organizations. Um, and again, I think a lot of them are focused on more of the tech end. So the more that you can, even if tech is not your strong suit, like, can I mess around in storyline and make like a glorified PowerPoint? Sure, I can, but like, I can't do the fancy stuff. So the more I've learned about it, like I don't have to, I'm not the one who, does it who does the tech part but the more i learn about it and the more informed i am about what it requires and what it takes to make an activity accessible the better i can plan in my writing and in 
my creative process, like then I can, I can plan for those things better. So it requires a lot of open communication in your organization, um, you know, including the instructional designers in accessibility discussions because it affects us, it, it affects the writing process. Um, so even if I don't have to carry it out, I can make stuff that's easier for my development team to carry out. I can make stuff that's better for my learners, um, you know, and, and more inclusive for them. So uh, just making sure that your organization is having those conversations or that you are doing the research to know what's possible, what's, um, you know, what the lift requires on the tech side so that you can better write for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that 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 is definitely good to know so that, you know, when you write, you are aware of um, what your developers actually need to do. Um, and then our, our last question, if uh, any of our community members would like to contact you or um, reach out to you, where could they do so? I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me. I'm listed as Rachel A. Snyder uh, at Artisan eLearning. So go ahead and message me on LinkedIn. Happy okay, to help. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for coming on uh, LCA Spotlight and being our our guest feature. And um, thank you for all the time you've given us today. Of course. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.